in this news roundup of a week for the 10th of February 2023. A Chinese sky balloon is blown out of the sky along with recent hopes of easing tension between the two countries. Russia apparently begins to ramp up for a major offensive as President Zelensky visits the UK and Europe. Did we just get the real story about the exploding Nord Stream pipelines or was it just a pipe dream? And in this week's short thought, the creative tension between change and stability that we all have to navigate. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. It seems like a long time ago now, but last weekend started with attention captured by a balloon that had been hanging in the air over the United States for the best part of a week. On Saturday, after an extended period of time where pundits debated and some raged and some urged calm, the US Air Force finally shot it down off the coast of South Carolina. The balloon, described as being the size of about three buses, was claimed by its owner, China, to be just a meteorological measurement balloon. Most everyone else said, nah, it's a spy balloon. It had entered US airspace by floating over Alaska, then via Canada to northern Idaho. It ended up over Montana, where there are fields of nuclear missile silos, by sheer fluke and coincidence, probably. This was certainly an in-your-face event, although it's quite likely the Chinese leadership did not organise this. Why? Because all the signs right now are that with a global pushback against China's more aggressive foreign policy voice over recent years, and with the disastrous manner in which it ended its zero-Covid policy recently, China is seriously wanting to ease relations with the West, at least in the short term. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was imminently due to visit China for a one-to-one -one talk with Xi Jinping, and that visit was very much being encouraged by the leadership. The fact this balloon led to it being cancelled doesn't seem like that was in their interests. And it's been speculated that it might have come about because some part of the Chinese system was not talking with another key part. The US administration certainly says that it believes that both the senior leadership of the military and the Chinese Communist Party, including Xi, were unaware of the mission. And that right now the leadership's trying to work out exactly how it happened. What about China's insistence that it was really all innocent? Just a weather balloon? Well, not really credible, even before the analysis began of the equipment that was on board. If it had been a climate research balloon blown off course, China would have quickly notified the Americans as soon as it seemed likely to enter its airspace. It was noted by CNN that similar balloons had been sighted in various places, but no fewer than four times hovering over Taiwan. Seems a lot of interest in meteorology over that specific location. Chinese state media quickly announced the removal of the head of weather services to support their contention that there was an error in that department. Although it was then subsequently noted by CNN that the individual so removed was already scheduled to leave his job and take up a post elsewhere. I have no way of verifying that specifically, so treat it as possible, maybe even probable, but not certain. What is certain is that China and America have used balloons and spy planes and who knows what else to pick up things that can't be detected by the various satellites they have in orbit, such as radio and other transmissions. They do it. We do it. They know we do it. We know they do it. It's just the highly visible, long-lasting nature of this incursion that turned it into a big focal point of interest. A lot of the covert surveillance and hacking that both sides do, as revealed on the US side by Edward Snowden, for instance, is more intrusive than this was, more important indeed, and largely ignored by journalists and politicians on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, of course, this one got traction because the two sides of a huge US political divide could use it as a stick to beat each other with. We saw a giant balloon debate, you could say. So Republicans attacked Biden for not shooting it down sooner, using it to portray him as weak. Democrats used it to create outrage at China's espionage and to criticise Republicans for proposing that it should have been downed when it was over land, where American citizens could have been injured by the falling debris. 
and so on and so on. But the real fallout was in China-US relations. Things are bad, so bad that when both sides have an interest in lowering the temperature, a little thing like this can still blow it up and inflame feelings and damage prospects. And it's possible the Chinese government have been encouraging Blinken's visit, particularly because now would be a really good time to get some better footing and reset of relations, because choppy waters lie ahead. Not least of which will be the intended visit by the US House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on the principle, uh, if Nancy can do it, so can I, to Taiwan. A move that when she did it provoked a big military response. And next time, well, we'll have to wait and find out. Of course, the main military action remains elsewhere. The Ukraine war news was all about President Zelensky's visit to the UK and then to the EU this week. Lots of speeches, politicians applauding his heroism while trying to avoid giving him too much of what he actually wants. Probably, though, the news should really have been about the fact that Russian forces show signs of beginning their next major offensive. They were described by the Institute for the Understanding of War as having regained the initiative after six months of it being on the other side and having begun their next major offensive in Luhansk. The pace of Russian operations have increased markedly during the past week, with conventional Russian troops attacking Ukrainian defensive lines and making, for now at least, relatively light gains. Combat footage, which the ISW has geolocated and confirmed as being in the Dvorichna area, shows Russian gains happening there. Several divisions, at least three, seem to have been committed to offensive operations, leading to the conclusion that the expected new Russian offensive has begun, albeit that it's still gearing up, not yet at full strength. There's also a trend of conventional Russian forces taking over from Wagner Group, which has also seen a reduction in Wagner recruitment from prison populations. The reduction partly because of a reduced role and partly, at least according to some, because the news has reached the prisons of how some of those who'd originally signed up were being used very lightly by Wagner as cannon fodder. Ukrainian intelligence is suggesting that this will all morph imminently into a major escalation, suggesting that Russia has prepared almost 2,000 tanks, 300,000 soldiers for a renewed offensive to focus on the Donbass region. If true... And I remind you that you can never take at face value what any combatant tells you during a time of war. That number of troops would be double the amount that were mobilised to the borders before the start of the war nearly a year ago. Such a backdrop gave more force to Zelensky's message in the EU, of course, as he painted once again Ukraine's fight as being on the front line of Europe against an out-of-control Russia. There's no doubt that he appeared throughout this trip as a leader of seriousness and substance. Being a war leader will do that for you, of course. Surrounded mostly, I have to say, by political pygmies and lightweights. The UK was excessively pleased with itself that he chose to visit there before the EU, cementing its place as the acknowledged top European supporter for Ukraine. Brexiteers in particular were purring with satisfaction while imagining the looks on the faces of the Eurocrats when the news of his visit broke. The EU leaders had to contend not only with being in second place, but also with the embarrassment that Zelensky's visit to them, highly sensitive intelligence data as that represented, managed to get leaked well in advance, thereby potentially putting him at risk. But he visited Brussels regardless, making his case for fighter jets to be sent to Ukraine and seeking to shore up the momentum behind the process, expected to be quite a long process, of becoming a part of the EU. For all the big talk and the photo opportunities, the visit raised as many questions as it answered, specifically to do with what is the expected end point. Officially, a number in the EU have been saying they believe in total military victory for Ukraine. Putin's forces invaded, they get defeated and kicked out of every last piece of the territory. And that would be the outcome best calibrated with keeping the world order based on the presumption of not invading your neighbours. But numerous analysts say that that outcome is a long way off, if it is even possible at all. And this week we saw a pointed prod at the position, in this case from China. In advance of Zelensky's visit to the EU, the top Chinese envoy to the bloc, Fu Kong, 
challenged the West for its stated intent to help Ukraine achieve complete victory. This came as it's reported by the Russian government that Xi Jinping is planning a trip to Moscow in the near future. Fu Kong said that China was worried about the escalation of the conflict and that it did not believe that simply providing weapons was the answer, calling instead for a move to the negotiating table. He also attacked the European Union for recent statements and indeed visits of parliamentarians again to Taiwan. China wasn't the only factor pushing back against Zelensky's momentum. This week, Elon Musk's SpaceX announced that the internet connection provided to Ukraine by its Starlink satellites could no longer be used for the purposes of guiding and controlling drones on the battlefield. Later, it was confirmed that the company had actively prevented that use by the Ukrainian armed forces. Company president Glyn Shotwell said that Starlink had been sent to Ukraine to, quote, keep the banks going, hospitals, keep families connected. He added, we know the military is using them for comms, and that's OK, but our intent was never to have them used for offensive purposes. Obviously, this is not a trivial matter for the forces concerned. Ukraine has a large network of surveillance drones, which have been critical to monitor Russia's troop movements, and never more so if Russia's about to move into a new offensive phase. Over the last six months, the Ukrainian military had become reliant on Starlink. After all, the terrestrial internet infrastructure had been taken out by Russia, either directly or via power outages. So it's hard to underestimate the likely impact impact when that suddenly becomes unusable, basically with zero notice. President Zelensky is likely to have been less exercised by the other pushback against him, this from an utterly bizarre direction, namely the fact that former founding member of Pink Floyd, Roger Waters, spoke to the United Nations Security Council, I kid you not, calling for a ceasefire and saying that NATO, the United States and President Zelensky were all partly to blame for the war. He was speaking to them at the invitation of Russia and he claimed to be speaking on behalf of a voiceless majority. Whatever next? We've had a teenage girl addressing the United Nations on climate change and now we have a 1970s prog rock band founder pontificating about geopolitics and war, invited to do so by one of the combatants in that war, no less. The script writers for Humankind, the 21st century, certainly seem to have a sense of the absurd, added to provide contrast to all the dark stuff they've thrown into this season, presumably. Thank goodness someone at least invented the clown emoji just when it was needed. Now the question is, do we need that emoji for the next item or not? I had a video a while ago where I presented the for and against arguments on who might have been responsible for the bombing of the Nord Stream pipelines. Naturally, I didn't argue for a specific conclusion because we didn't have evidence either way, although I presented the arguments made on each side and said that the balance of probability seemed to be that it was carried out by Russia, although you certainly couldn't definitely conclude so. The only thing that's really emerged since then is that Sweden has been somewhat cagey about publicising what they may or may not have found in their initial investigations, which seems a bit odd. Easy to read too much into it, but if you were minded to, it would slightly strengthen the side that argues it was someone other than Russia, but still no hard evidence either way. Well, this week, a new little flurry of attention on this was created when investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch claimed that this was definitely a US operation carried out by the CIA. On a newly set up substack, he published a long piece suggesting that American deep sea divers, using NATO military exercise as a cover, planted mines along the pipelines that were later detonated remotely. Now, on the one hand, you might say, well, so what? Roger Waters probably thinks that happens as well. People write all sorts of things on Substack. Except Seymour Hirsch isn't just some rando nutter with an opinion. He is one of the big historic Pulitzer Prize winning names in investigative reporting. He broke the story of 500 civilians being murdered by US soldiers in My Lai during the Vietnam War. He wrote about the torture of prisoners at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. So... Was this a detailed, documented investigation to finally present to the world that concrete evidence we've been waiting for? 
Well, not exactly. The entire story hinged upon the reported word of one anonymous source with direct knowledge of the operational planning. Now, I try not to quote stories as news here if they depend on anonymous sources, certainly just one source, because it can so obviously be abused and the mainstream media has been known to so abuse it. So if we apply that standard to the mainstream, shouldn't we apply it to substack authors as well, even celebrated ones? His case is not helped by the fact that some of his other more recent stories have also been called into question precisely for relying heavily on anonymous sources with no supporting evidence. So, for instance, he did an article about how the US found Osama bin Laden and another casting doubt on the use of chemical weapons on Syrian civilians. Now, that latter one was something that has been extensively documented from multiple evidence sources, as was outlined in a response to his article at the time by open source investigation agency Bellingcat. So, which is this? A new triumphant blast that recalls the glory days of globally important scoops? or an apparent continued descent into trading off past glories with content of dubious veracity. The US government has said that his claims are wholly and completely false, which is exactly what you would expect them to say. I mean, if he was right, or indeed, if he was wrong. So that's not much help. The thing is, two things can be true at once. It could be that Hershey's making shit up to give his new substack an initial surge of supporters, while at the same time, the US or another Western state was indeed responsible for the explosions. The Times of London reported recently that the German government, the country at the other end of the pipeline, remember, was believed to be open to the idea that it was carried out by a Western state, and it quoted a Western analyst who admitted to being surprised at how little information had so far been released. Add to that the 23 diplomatic and intelligence officials in nine different Western countries who told the Washington Post that they had yet to see evidence linking Russia to the attack, so there's definitely some scope for intrigue. But whether Seymour Hersh just gave us the first salvo of an unravelling story, or simply the latest opportunity for the use of that clown emoji, right now we don't know. And much though I love them, that goes for people in the comments to this video below swearing that they really do know. Which dovetails nicely into this. Let's talk about change and stability. When people organise themselves into political parties, they become broadly in favour of one or the other of those, at least in principle. And no doubt in doing so, they believe that their version is always right. But it's the tension between the two which is essential. John Stuart Mill said that a party of order or stability and a party of progress or reform are both necessary elements of a healthy state of political life. We know that change is essential. Darwin noted that the most successful species in evolutionary terms were not the strongest, not the fastest, but the ones who were most adaptable to change. Arguably, this is why capitalism has been dominant for so long. Businesses, or at least the best of them, are the human institutions that have become the most skilled at embracing and adapting to change. It's not easy. You have to work hard on it. But the marketplace changes even more rapidly than natural systems, and every current business leader can see a landscape littered with the corporate corpses of those who didn't change fast enough or didn't change in the right way. The trouble is, it's easy to look at that situation with survivor's bias. The fact is, a number of the failed businesses tried to change just as quickly, but they got it wrong. And a number of the old-style big companies were predicted to go bust when they were slow and cautious with the rise of the internet. But many of them then came to do just fine, while only a handful of the early pioneers survived to become the Amazons of the world. As the John Stuart Mill quote implies, it's never just for one thing. You look at the world you live in and you work out the change that's happening and what's coming that you have to adapt to. And then you have to also see the attempted changes that undermine the solid fundamentals of what you've got for actually no added benefit. And those are the things that you would fight against. If you get political traditions based on just half of that dynamic then you should expect to find that you own half the things that are right and half of the things that are wrong. And the other side is kind of the mirror image. 
may not be exactly half depending on where history is at any particular moment, but it will never be massively more one than the other. So all of us have to actively try and make sense of it, is the point. What are the changes coming that are going to force me to adapt? If we're talking big changes to our living context, there are more than we've seen for a long time. The changing demographics of societies that were mostly growing and young are quickly becoming shrinking ones that are older. Huge change. The landscape of technology and artificial intelligence is becoming transformative on human society again in ways we haven't yet worked through what those implications will be. And of course then climate change, for all that some in my audience are holding out against the reality of it, is going to lead to a significant reordering of how our societies are powered. All of those things are a mix of those two elements. Changes that are inevitable and must be adapted to, and also often the vehicles for poorly thought through change proposals that should be resisted. The trick, as always, is to tell them apart. If you look to businesses, many are currently adapting to the impacts of climate change that are already being felt in their agricultural supply chains. Some of them are likely following strategies that will work. Others may be following strategies that will not work. Some are seeking to hold off legislation that will impair them from making the maximum profit they can from the declining industries. Because yes, in a standard market, the best companies can still make profit from the declining market sectors if they manage them smartly. For people who would shut them down tomorrow without a clue as to the cascade of unintended consequences that would follow are amongst those whose ideas should be at least challenged but probably fully resisted. The point of all this is that you have to work it out. There is no lazy, easy mode of existence where we can just assume that the people on our side are right about everything and the other side is wrong. All the more reason not to tether yourself to one side, in my personal view, but I know that's asking a lot. At the very least, you shouldn't disengage your brain when you do so. You have to work it out for yourself, for your family, for your business, for your country, if you want to survive and thrive. What are the changes to which we have to adapt? What are the ill-conceived changes we need to resist? They're harder questions to answer than you think they are. And yes... I'm sorry, but there are consequences to getting them wrong. All right, I will be doing a Q&A video next week for Patreon supporters' questions. If you are one of that crucial and select band, you will see I posted an invite there. Give me your questions in response to that post. And this is just one way, of course, of marking how important that group actually is, because as you know, without them, this channel wouldn't be possible at all. If you would like to join them in supporting the independent fact focus and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.